good afternoon everyone so welcome to the fourth dr rajendra rathor colloquium which was established in 2019 to honor late dr rajendra rathor who was an alumnus of iit kanpur and a very distinguished scientist so i welcome all of you to this function event today which is very important for iit kanpur chemistry department and to start with i request professor bera to welcome mrs nigam by giving a bouquet <laughs> then i request professor bera to welcome the distinguished speaker today professor jeev kulkarni i request professor bera to address the audience give a brief description of the colloquium and also to invite the speaker thank you thank you ramesh dear colleagues students Uh, Mrs. Nigam and the family of Dr. Rajendra Rathor and distinguished guests. It is an important event every year in our department to host this Rajendra Rathor Colloquium in Chemistry. This series has been established in the department in 2019 through an endowment fund created through generous donations from Mrs. Rajni Nigam. wife of late dr rajendra rathor and their family members and well wishers this journey started some time back as i told you 2019 and the first lecture was delivered by professor s chandrasekharan on 2020 and in this context i would also like to say that dr rajendra rathor did his msc project with chandrasekharan then uh, next year it was by professor sapashashi sarkar and last year we had professor s sampat with us to deliver this distinguished colloquium we are very delighted that this tradition uh, is continued with professor kulkarni as our esteemed speaker for this year just to give little information about dr rajendra rathor he was a 1980 to 84 batch alumnus of iit kanpur who received a mc degree in chemistry uh, as i mentioned he did his master thesis with professor s chandrasekharan and then continued in the same group as a as research associate up until january 1986 he moved to canada for his to receive his phd degree in organic chemistry and received the degree in 1990 he was a visiting assistant professor at the university of houston and then joined as faculty at market university in 2000 later he became fleschinger heberman professor of organic chemistry at the university he was a scientist of very high caliber he made many key contribution in the areas of organic supramolecular and material chemistry who were in the department for several year you must have seen him he was a frequent visitor in the department and he gave many talk and you have seen his enthusiasm and excitement about his chemistry and the quality of his work unfortunately he departed this world on february 2018 this colloquium is dedicated to his memory and again where the department of chemistry extremely proud to host this seminar series now i would introduce the speakers for this year professor kulkarni he did his phd from iisc bangalore and currently a professor at the jncsa sir he was at center for nano Sci- nano and soft matter science as a director and then he returned to jncsa sir in january 2020 to take over as the president professor kulkarni and his research group have made remarkable contribution to the areas of new strategies in synthesis of nanomaterials nano patterning and nano device fabrication including of molecular system the recipe is developed emphasizes the importance of simple design near ambient working under working condition solution based processing as well as low cost instrumentation the research work has been documented in numerous peer reviewed articles and multiple patents he has received several award to name a few sir c v raman young scientist award professor c n r rao oresan mr si medal c r s i medals He is an elected fellow of the All Science Academies in the country, Asia Pacific Academy of Materials, and many others. With this brief introduction, 
प्लीज जॉइन मी एक्सटेंडिंग ए वार्म वेलकम प्रोफेसर कुलकर्णी फॉर राजेंद्र राठर कॉलोकियम इन केमिस्ट प्रोफेसर कुलकर्णी गुड इवनिंग थँक यू प्रोफेसर बेरा फॉर द काइंड इन्व्हिटेशन अँड हॉस्पिटॅलिटी थँक यू आय एम हिअर फॉर अ पर्पज ॲज यू नो इट्स इन इट्स अ ग्रेट ऑनर टू गिव्ह अ लेक्चर इन इन मेमरी ऑफ डॉक्टर राजेंद्र राथोर इज अ कोलोकियम एस्टॅब्लिश इन केमिस्ट्री दिस इज फॉर द इयर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री esteemed colleagues there being the fourth of his speaker it's an honor that mrs rajni nigam wife of uh, dr rathor is here madam thank you for encouraging scientific research in the country in your own way i would like to also thank uh, his brother uh, rajesh who is here you know all in and all it is for me home coming for visiting iit k after covid uh, this is the first time i am coming but i have been here for a number of times in the past attending conferences phd why was i know the vibrancy of the campus and today in the last few hours i had a chance to interact with uh, many of you thank you once again for inviting and before i dwell upon the formal title since there are many young colleagues around here and also students i thought i'll spare a few minutes uh, talking about the overall activities you know give a glimpse of activities in the group so that there is a possibility of uh, collaboration in my group we believe in synthesis synthesizing our own materials our own active materials for devices i also believe in as professor bera mentioned to take things forward in terms of you know making our own devices prototypes interacting with industry and trying to see translational possibilities and i have been having great mentors all through great collaborators mentor professor cn rao and all the way to professor vinod singh professor pushpendu came all the way from bangalore to listen to me so likewise many many senior colleagues who have encouraged me many many collaborators so the host of activities what i am showing you is all outcome of present and past students as well as collaborators and encouragement from mentors as i said we take our materials to devices to products as much as possible we make very sincere effort in the group the first one here on the left top corner you see this uh, few people holding a sheet of pet plastic this is not ordinary plastic this actually runs for 4 kilometers a piece of that is torn out and held for the photograph taking the photograph across it has very fine mesh of aluminum and from end to end it measures just about 40 50 ohms it is transparent yet electrically conducting these contrasting properties are built into this special material because of our invention in crackle lithography it all started with uh, sort of a, a, a ms project and led to couple of phd thesis several patents and publications and eventually translation to industry there are other examples also along with the same idea but i just picked up one of one among them to showcase the other activity we have in the group is to do with graphene we make plenty of graphene of course single layer graphene but more interestingly we make twisted multi layer stacks when i say twisted we have angular relation in the stacking of graphene and because of the twist each individual layer will have decoupling from the neighborhood they won't be in the usual bernal stacked way and the decoupling brings about lots of interesting physical properties and th there is a lot of literature on this the the physics way of making it like you know lithographically using manipulators people bring in single layers and lay them one over another with a desired angle but in my group we synthesize them so as born they are all having twists so you can cut out a portion and use it for your purpose 
and you can make it out from the raman spectrum uh, you know if you if you if you have a habit of reading raman spectrum of graphene it would make immediate sense that the 2d peak is so high compared to the g peak this must be a decoupled layer and as you can see much of this activity is born out of collaboration you know i believe in collaboration strong collaboration i am always on the lookout for collaborations and uh, i happened to listen to a colleague of mine who is subhi george in a seminar where he presented this kind of donor acceptor based to supramolecular assemblies these are 1d fibers born out of aqueous medium and the way the configuration you know whatever he was describing my intuition told me that they must be semiconducting they must be electrically conducting so we just picked up few few of those fi fibers from his lab and started making devices wonderful results we got making transistors out of them and all the way to supercapacitors you see this is an example of a supercapacitor with an exceptional operating window of 8 volt usually all organic electrolytes organic electrolytes are better than the aqueous but the organic ones also give up around 3 to 4 volts but here we have 8 volt and off late in the last 3 to 4 years i made an adventure to get into artificial neural networks but in our own way when i say artificial we don't use the biological neurons we don't even go to the foundry we don't go to the lithography labs we just <coughs> assemble them in the laboratory so this is a deweighted metal film wherein you know these tiny particles in between are capable of growing filaments across under electrical pulsing conditions and we can make them mimic as a biological neuron would do in terms of optimizing parameters we are pretty close i think in the next few months within a year we should be able to hit upon exactly the same parameters what a biological neuron uses in terms of the thresholds and the spiking what not so this is the latest interest of mine and this is at the basic science level it has not seen any form of translation at all so on one hand you have here something which is entirely translated and the other end in terms of the trl level this is just around 2 to 3 i would say so these are the kind of activities we are doing uh, in bangalore but the title i chose to speak today is very dear to me this is related to gold it's a rather a simple issue uh, but it gave us a lot of surprises and that's how the whole topic was built upon and we ended up reviewing this topic uh, a couple of my students are here and uh, it appeared in annual review of materials research in this article we actually address what is the tendency in metals in 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 existing in lattices other than their native native in the sense the bulk ones so we all know gold exists in face centered cubic lattice whatever jewelry we wear or you know coatings we do that is all strictly face centered cubic lattice so is platinum but if you take ruthenium on the other hand it goes to hexagonal close packed pack naturally osmium also these are all well known facts if you look at the periodic table actually what metals exist in what crystal structures everything is well established but when it comes to tiny nano crystals of the order of 1 2 3 nanometer you know not too big below 10 nanometer so to say there is a lot of surface area you know in respect of the bulk itself there is nothing much bulk there it's all surface area and because of that surface energies do not tally the way they would do in the bulk and because of that tiny nano crystals tend to get into you know orthorhombic or tetragonal bct stands for body center tetragonal bco stands for body center orthorhombic structures they are all lesser symmetry than cubic and good metals like noble metals like gold platinum hate to go to these lattices there have been plenty of work in the literature physicist driving gold crazy you know take it to around few hundred gigapascals with uh, higher temperatures like 500 degrees centigrade and only to see the fcc diffraction peaks picking up a little hcp hexagonal close packing but the moment the pressure and temperatures are withdrawn it just gets back to native fcc so robust is cubic structure and it can be very well explained and it is explained out in the literature because of the electronic structure and all that and uh, it is very very hard to to drive 
gold into any other type of lattice. So is platinum. And we will understand that in a minute. But when it comes to nano crystals, it is rather easy because of the conditions I what I explained, because of the excessive surface area. So if you look at the literature survey and see, are there clear examples of uh, bigger crystals than the nano crystals where people have identified and studied foreign lattices, you know, and uh, such examples we couldn't find. And uh, our interest actually got increased in the field what we were working on. And that's how we made further progress. You see, if you start out with individual atoms, I see a lot of students join now. You start out with a metal precursor and you reduce, you will form this tiny nuclei. These also can be formed physical way, like by laser ablation also you can pull out atoms and build tiny clusters. And when you do that, either chemically or uh, physically, you end up typically with the two types of seeds. This is a polyhedral single crystal seed and this is multiplied twin. It's called twin because there are many crystalline domains here and they are also in some sort of crystal symmetry. This is typically five-fold uh, symmetry and these, uh, if you make them grow, they have a tendency to become decahedrons. Here I am talking about a finite number of atoms. This, this may be measuring just about two nanometers or so and when you make them grow, in the literature, if you see decahedras of the order of, uh, you know, 50 nanometer, 100 nanometer, I have not seen anything bigger than that, okay? Because it's very difficult to make them grow further, for the reasons I'm going to explain. Here, we have these polyhedral shapes and going by, again, various aspect ratios and all that, you can have them as octahedrons, cuboctahedrons or simple cube itself, okay? Cubic structure. And this is where, this is what dominates gold platinum kind of lattices and this is where the literature stands this is all which is covered in the literature what we did in the lab is first try to grow these nuclei bigger and bigger okay and so here is the case this cuboctahedron is now grown into a giant micro crystal this is one micron bar so people normally deal with one tenth of this but here we have done nearly 10 times micron so it is a 10 micron wide huge cuboctahedral microcrystal. And you can very vividly see in the SEM image, these are 100 facets. You can go by the geometry and mark them. Anything squarish is 100, anything triangular is 111. And we could also grow under certain conditions, decahedras to this extent. These also several microns wide. And here is so beautiful that these 111 facets actually make the entire crystal. There's hardly any thickness to this. It is actually both sides we have 111 capped with 111 and in the middle you have uh, the 100s which are enclosing the two uh, uh, you know these pentatwin uh, uh, crystallites. So th that's the seed here. So what do we do with them? We can make them grow further. The challenge was to actually make them grow further and further and see what happens. In fact, we were also interested in looking at the plasmonic properties, but all that went into the background. Crystal growth itself became a big occupation. So here we deal with the uh, This is born out of a metal organic complex. This is the tetraoctyle ammonium bromide, which is holding in its tummy the AuCl4 minus ion. Okay, it's a very simple uh, phase transfer reagent we have used for the aqueous uh, uh, chlororic acid and pick up these ions and now you can take away the organic layer, it is with you. You can even convert that into powder and play around later. When we subject it to heat on a hot plate on a, using a glass slide as substrate, just about the temperature, 120, 130 degrees centigrade, when the organic starts moving out. And when it starts moving out, gold is left behind and because of plenty of hydrogen around, it also gets reduced. And here is a chance for you to make this gold grow into a crystal while you have a control of adding atom by atom to the nucleus, to the seed. That is a precision, right? It depends on your dilution, further optimizations, whatever one, one could be doing. By doing so, several optimization steps, we could achieve microplates like this. These are all 111 terminated microplates and the thickness, the facet is 100. So both sides we have extended 111s. And the thickness is made up of 100. You can see the thickness here. 
And these microsplates, if, if you nicely clean them up, they are single crystalline and you can find lots of usage. We have built molecular devices using them, using gold plates as electrodes. You know, you can have self-assembled monolayers and put another microplate on top. It carries the weight. It becomes a sandwich device. And now you can see lots of switching happening because molecules actually undergo conformation changes against photons, against stress and whatnot. So we have studied those aspects. I will not get into those details. And <clears throat> these are available in micro level. You can actually almost see them visibly, but an ordinary optical microscope will help you actually pull out and play with them. That is the size I am talking about. On, <clears throat> on a similar track, if you take AU decahedron and trying to make it grow, the story is not the same. Here what happens is, it is well acknowledged in the literature, even working with very, very tiny seeds in the 80s and 90s, people have done extensive electron microscopy to show that there is a lot of strain hidden in these multiplied twinned uh, facets. That is because going by the lattice geometry, any 111 if you take the triangular shape, it has to extend 70.53 degrees. When you do so, when you are filling up the pentagon, there is an angular gap of 7.35 degrees. Who will take care of that? It is only the twinning, the defects which come around these, the, along these edges. So, the, many defects get filled up here and this is where the strain is born in this pentagonal structure and that is how it is able to fill up the, the gap. So, when we see a solid structure like this, it looks as if it is entirely filled up. It is entirely filled up, just that the crystallinity along these borders is ill-defined. So, there is a lot of you know, defects lying out here uh, at the edges which give rise to the strain in the seed. And if you try to make it grow, it is not the most preferable one because already it is hiding a lot of strain in the tummy and uh, one has to be playing tricks to make it grow. Otherwise, it would normally get into these kind of structures and grow into microplates. That is a natural tendency. Yeah. So, to make it grow, what we did was we started playing around with different foreign molecules or seeds. What worked magic for us is to bring in AG plus there. <coughs> Again, we wanted to make actually AG, AU alloy to study the plasmonic behaviors in this. We had set up actually very extended experiment, but it led to something else, matter of serendipity. And so we take a decahedra like this and uh, try to make it grow under similar conditions. It grew into this kind of bipyramidal <coughs> structure. I have some wonderful pictures to share. I will not get into the chemical precursor mix and all the optimization steps and all. Just to bear in mind, we have AU3 plus to the extent of 70 percent and AG plus to the extent of 30 percent by more weight. Rest of it is all organics. And do remember that there is a BR here, bromine ion there, and that allows AG plus. Anytime AG plus wants to come out, it would grab it. And that is a trick which is playing out here as you will see. <coughs> what happens now? If you take the decahedra, tiny decahedra like this, this is just about 100 nanometer and make it grow in the presence of AG ion and you will see these kind of structures coming up. Sort of needle type of double tip needles and they tend to have some nice corrugations on top. I have a detailed SEM to show you here. You see the body of it, lots of corrugative structures. And if you see from the tip side, this is a typical pentagonal seed. I am sure the other side also is made up of the same type of tip. But in the middle you have petal kind of structures like this. We have thoroughly analyzed them, what they are. Actually they are all decahedra stacked together, but with a little, 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 little twist all along. And some of the size of the decahedra increases to the center and then again it diminishes. There are chemical reasons for that we have argued out in our paper. So we can grow such crystals maintaining the pentagonal unstable geometry into this kind of around 10 micron length micro crystals. Again, they are all available to visualize uh, using sort of good optical microscope. See, they are all rice kind of stuff. We call them as gold rice, right? So, nice, you know, one dimensional, I don't want to say dimensional here because they are all micro crystals, just linear structures, okay? And they all look like rice here, gold rice. We call them as gold rice. And <coughs> Again, one should remember the temperature, various conditions play a big role here. It is a, it's a magic recipe, I must say. Then only you will end up getting these kind of structures. And having done that, 
we now scan the entire face space now we have many things to vary concentrations relative ion concentrations and what kind of solvent medium we use what kind of substrate we use its volatility and the temperature what not here i am just showing you one example uh, which led to again very interesting results that is to do with the thermodynamic parameter temperature when we take this kind of a mix gold silver uh, encapsulated with the phase transfer reagent into the organic medium we just shower spin coat or you know doctor blade coat coat on a glass substrate and gently heat it up at around 135 degrees centigrade you will see those structures what i showed you needle type of structures coming up they are all hosting the pentagonal uh, geometry and then but it is entirely face centered cubic you can see here 111 peak of gold in the fcc uh, with 200 here okay nothing unusual just the morphology is different but just that everything exists in the face centered cubic but if we do the same starting with the precursor but don't take it to 135 jump to 220 directly is a tiny temperature change we have affected the kinetics of the process phenomenally and when we do that you see new xrd peaks coming up and this was actually a shocker to me because gold is known to be so robust and how could in the in the gold diffractive gram you end up seeing other type of peaks it's just impossible but we did repeated experiments in fact we have done thousands of experiments by now and you see here compared to this 111 of fcc the that region is quite broad hosting lots of peaks here and that could be of course the 111 of fcc is still there it's quite to slime and we also have which we have identified through a lot of struggle several months went by to fix a space group you know do the profile fitting and all that these are birth of uh, you know body center of thrombic and tetragonal phases hidden here some of the profile fitting is shown it can get very very complicated but xrd is one it works up to fourth decimal in angstrom so that's the assuring factor there are lots of guiding factors there in terms of the chi square values and what not one can be riding on them and fixing the crystallography of the system being studied and so here we have a perfect fcc and that is now distorted into tetragonal or orthorhombic depending on slight changes in abc right and by doing so by by virtue of symmetry you also bring in one atom in the center so it gets actually body center and uh, this is the super cell if you take two fccs you can make one bct born out of that putting one in center this is a bct expression of fcc itself but then you can cause a little variation in c by a ratio it will become truly tetragonal and that's what has happened in our case so the super cell uh, uh, schematic is there now this is the laboratory xrd we were really hunting for who will help us through collaboration looking for one individual crystal and tell us what's happening there and uh, finally uh, we got in touch with uh, desi uh, in germany petra 3 beam line and uh, we actually fixed up a beam line time for 5 days day and night with one crystal we struggled and that's the crystal which is here this is a cm image of that so the idea here was to use the synchrotron synchrotron for the sake of students extremely high intensity x ray beam okay it is some it is like visible light sun we have right this is the x ray sun in the lab okay so these are all national facility elsewhere and in india also we have one in indo doing other special activities but uh, a really high energy x ray synchrotron is yet to come up in india so we have to go all the way to germany now this particular beam line there are several beam line this particular beam line has a speciality that you can trim down the beam to a collimation of 50 nanometer by 50 nanometer very very focused very very tiny beam if you have that what wonders you can do you can hold the crystal <coughs> or whatever system you have and you can go around and scan and look at what crystallography phase is you know which place of it. the morphology itself we can study so we took one single crystal and with great difficulty mounted it and all that the very interesting story around it i don't tell you now but this is the final geometry this how the collimated x ray beam is coming 50 nanometer by 50 nanometer and this is all the mechanism we have here to move the crystal to rotate and all that and this is the x ray fluorescence detector this is the eigen detector the x ray diffracting beam detector here so what why we need this uh, fluorescence detector once the the crystal is on the beam line 
Crystal itself is invisible. You don't know whether you have placed it rightly or so. Where you are imaging, where the beam is falling. So to see to that, you have a fluorescence detector, which will go on collecting data whenever you go in a raster fashion. I've shown on the uh, right side. Unfortunately, this movie is not working anymore. I don't know what to do. My student has left, so I can't activate it again. So this is the image taken with fluorescence detector. You can see the gold yellow fluorescence. You are monitoring the yellow fluorescence. And that's how you know that you are actually shining the crystal and no, not throwing the beam elsewhere. By doing so, you are now collecting, you know, from a particular region. This is summed up data, by the way, totally summed up. E every time the beam will be in one position. By being in one position, now you capture the diffraction. Now move to the next one, again capture the diffraction pattern. So on and so forth. We produced one terabyte of data in five days and that's it. It was crash landing. It took nearly one and a half, one and a half years to put together a story and publish something out of that. It was such mammoth exercise, but I think collaboratively, collaboratively everything is possible. What I'm showing you here is the outline of the microcrystal. And this is the fluorescence you collect at one time, staying there. And this is the kind of spot you get. So this also has multiple regions. In fact, this, the spot itself is spread out. If you zoom in, you see actually cluster of spots there. And when you see the entire diffractogram, there will be again mirror reflections, symmetry related reflections and all that. That only adds to your confidence, not complication. So if you see one peak here, diffraction peak, if you walk a particular distance angularly, you must see another spot there. Then only it is authentic, right? So the authenticity of data collection goes like this. And now you move to the next region, then to the next region like this. I've just shown one snapshot, uh, you know, where how you could be collecting data. And... Um, this is yet another data going from the top to the bottom. We did several thousand raster scans like this and averaged out the data to make it more and more authentic. Well, the summary line is this, what we learned out of this. We have indeed packed the decahedras to form the 1D needle type of structure. We call it bipyramidal structure, corrugated bipyramidal twisted structure. What is the twist? From one tip to the other tip, there is a total of six degree twist there. And that's the strain, it's a huge strain built into the crystal. And because of that, now gold probably cannot exist in FCC at all. We learned so many things from this. The tips are made up of nearly FCC, with little FCC, but with little strain. But the shell of the particle, you know, is having a strained FCC, strained FCC, whereas the core of it is entirely non-FCC. Because the core has very little mechanism to release the stress, right? So as you come to the outer body, it is more like FCC, but when you go internally, it is more like orthorhombic or tetragonal phase. So this is a, a magical finding for us. We actually celebrated and such a deep understanding we could get only because of the uh, synchrotron beamline and the type of collaboration we have had. And um, yeah, the other curiosity is like if we do have gold existing in uh, uh, non-cubic lattices, what kind of optical properties one would expect? You know, you all know that gold colloidal sol, Faraday sol should have plasmonic absorption giving rise to 520 nanometer peak uh, in the UV visible spectrum, what these would give. In fact, gold FCC itself has been studied in the form of nano rods. People have looked at how the aspect ratio of the nano rods influence not only the uh, uh, plasmonic, you know, multi uh, modes also people have studied, a lot of studies there in the literature. So we also looked at, again, we prepared our sample where two slides were spread out like this and then we could control the aspect ratio also by tuning the optical, the, uh, the recipe, the synthetic conditions. You know, the, interestingly, I didn't get into the details, when you are only at the decahedra, two decahedra attached with each other with a little facet, 100 facet, it is purely FCC with little strain. But when you make it grow like this, as the aspect ratio increases, the non-FCC content goes on increasing linearly. This is something which we found. We could actually titrate it using X-ray diffraction methods and relate it to all the properties what we saw. Here is one example where as the aspect ratio is increasing here, okay, here it is increasing, uh, aspect ratio uh, is going like 2.89 all the way to 4.86 here. And you see the plasmonic peak of gold around here, typical. And these are multipolar peaks, the spread out. It's exactly like what a FCC a nanowire or nano rod would do, even if it is 200, 300 nanometer. 
need not even be micron size. So I was interested in looking at actually electronic properties and electro optical properties and all that. But soon after uh, you know doing little theoretical calculations with collaborators, we understood that the free electrons in these lattices are not very different uh, than those in the face centered cubic. So we actually stopped the activity uh, doing any more measurements on the optical behavior. Yeah, here it is where it shows uh, this is aspect ratio and this is the BCOT mole fraction, non FCC mole fraction here. So this is how it varies. We can actually control the amount of non cubic lattice in these crystallites. And this is the this is how the plasmonic peak varies. More interesting things are awaited here. I will need another five, seven minutes at least to tell you the most interesting aspects. That is, you have made now the non-FCC, right? Moving away from the native lattice. Can how what it takes to get back, right? Can he it be do something so that get the gold back into its native lattice, which we are familiar with? So one could be using adsorption of some molecules and other types of reagents. Temperature is one parameter, pressure is another. You could also be using energetic ion beam, so on and so forth. I am just showing you a couple of examples. There are lots of uh, interesting results we found. This is the one where thermal stability, you know, because it is hiding strain, one would think that it should be metastable in a matter of minutes or hours or a day, few days. It would just go back naturally at ambient temperature to FCC form. That is not true. You know, there are crystals in the lab now several years, they are still stuck in their strain lattices which are non-cubic. Even while heating to up to 500 degrees centigrade, you see the spread of peaks here. There are still a lot of non fcc content and only around 600 or so and 700 of course you make it entirely FCC. So just around 600, 700 degrees centigrade, the strain gets released and the crystallite now gets into FCC form. And this is something my colleague uh, Umesh predicted few years ago with this uh, Jack's paper we wrote together, wherein we have shown, along with the synthesis and other characterization, possibility of coexisting, you know, co-hosting several types of non fcc lattices in these things. So we call them as DCT1, DCT3, blah blah. You know, going only purely by theoretical intuition. I was in fact arguing with Umesh that how it is possible at all, only to realize down two years that we indeed are hosting such foreign lattices in our crystallites. How we came to know? We did uh, argon bombardment. In argon bombardment, it being a physical method, it is not like thermal, you know, it spreads out everywhere. So you can take the crystal and give a flux with argon plus ions and they come and bombard like bullet and impart, and impart uh, energy, kinetic energy, very precise kinetic energy onto the microcrystal, unlike temperature. By doing so, we could actually monitor the phase transformation very carefully just by increasing the exposure to argon beam, right? And surprising things came up here. If you study the diffraction peak positions here, this is the A parameter. Our typical BCO stops here and the new BC, BCT1 has grown here. You can see that. This is the A parameter and this is the C parameter. So the A goes on changing and then it holds on to a value and C goes on expanding. Such minute details we could study and stabilize in various types of non-cubic lattices using argon exposure. These are energetic argon ions. And then on chemical study, you know, you can take aggressive sodium sulfide kind of uh, species and absorb that and you can, at elevated temperature, room temperature nothing much happens. At 100 degrees centigrade you can cause some phase transformation and you can expect the 111 peak of FCC to come up. We could work out the activation energy, all that. And also we did uh, thiol adsorptions at elevated temperatures and we could derive the energy required for sulfur adsorption, why at all the phase transformation should happen. And my colleagues from IAC joined and we published a paper looking at how thiol molecules adsorbed down to these non-cubic lattices can induce phase transformation at elevated temperatures. But the most interesting result is here. This is where uh, the, uh, what is that, uh, Tata company, Tanishk got in touch with us. Hey, you guys have made some sort of different gold. What is that? Let us know. Because by then, new scientists from UK interviewed me and uh, they published a magazine uh, titled uh, Different Type of Gold. Some funny thing there, weird type of gold, something they wrote. And that caught world attention. I had a couple of interviews from various global agencies and Tanishk people came to know about it. 
and your next dodo why don't you come so i did visit their r&d lab at hosur bangalore and they showed us how they make jewelry and all that they were saying like your gold can get into jewelry you know it will enhance the value blah blah so we are somewhere down the line there are lots of challenges but we are not been really uh, able to bring out a technology out of that well the basic study goes like this what interested the world we all know that cubic gold can form amalgam right it readily forms amalgam and it, it's well known process theoretically it has been well understood in the metallic radius of mercury is same as gold very nearly so when you have a gold facet mercury walks in there and can replace the symmetric cell one one atom at a time and get in there gold will not know that and then it can go subsurface and as this happens more and more you already formed amalgam without gold noticing it it has transformed into amalgam this is a simpler version of it there are great theoretical details here if we do the same here taking cuboctahedrons which exist in cubic lattice and you uh, treat with mercury you see nothing left there you see the footprint of it this is where it was sitting but no longer right it got eaten away by amalgam and that's almost a fluid if the mercury concentration is high and gets washed away in our treatment whereas the rice particle which is hosting non cubic lattices on top you can see is quite robust it's there right because now the same trick mercury atom cannot play with this because there is a lot of strain and the surface unit cell are not symmetric as they would be in a cubic lattice so because because of this mercury is not able to chemisorb on the surface and go subsurface and that's the reason it is now protected from formation of amalgam very different type of chemical property and take another example aqua regia aqua regia has been known for centuries now since the days of alchemy that that's it was called aqua regia because this is the only liquid which could dissolve gold right and now here is our gold where it can stand aqua regia uh, you can see here a control you see we have to prove to the world so what we do we take the fcc gold that's in the form of a microplate and bring in our rice which are non cubic and treat with aqua regia you see that this already developed lot of defects nothing has happened to these rice particles right of course under the given conditions but if you do extend the conditions there like in terms of longer time longer concentration whatever our non fcc also give up but they give up in a controlled way as we expected based on the synchrotron measurements you see when you take these uh, bipyramidal structures the tips are pentagonal right these are the least strained fcc okay and the shell is also least strained as you go deeper into the rice particle there are strained uh, uh, non cubic structures so when we uh, uh, treat it with aqua regia tips are the ones which are given up first see here tips are eaten away right and you go for extended treatment of aqua regia then everything is eaten away except the body and this stays for a very very long time not eaten away so that shows the robustness of non cubic lattices of gold with respect to many of these reagents we can do wonderful chemistry with this we can electrolytically bring lots of metals for example this is platinum coated here platinum likes to go on to the platinum and gold are cousins in the fcc lattice everything is very similar you can easily coat electrolytically platinum on gold and here is a case it platinum also finds this whole thing is something foreign though it is made up of gold atoms but not the cubic gold so it doesn't like to go there it goes only towards the tip which are nearly fcc and you come to copper the same story copper just decorates only the tips there you you can prove it by doing some spectroscopy you can see the signal copper signal comes only from the dumbbell shape here internally this all gold is left without copper deposition so such lot of chemistry could be played around having known what we have in hand one weird property i will tell you and then i'll complete my story have you known gold catalysis yes it is known since 1980s gold exhibiting heterogeneous catalysis is known in fact it was predicted that even all automobile mobiles will be, uh, uh, automobiles will have their exhaust fixed with gold catalyst what i mean is take tiny gold particles just about 2 to 3 nanometer and disperse them in oxide matrices like alumina titania and all that lots of studies are there because the strong metal support interaction gold property gets modified and then it can do co oxidation to co2 much more effectively than the existing expensive rhodium and all that in fact there was in japan a dedicated lab studying gold catalysis for this purpose 
but experimental hurdles and all finally it is not launched for whatever reason so gold becomes catalytic only when it is 1 2 nanometer dactone oxidic interface anything more than that it exhibits noble character it just doesn't care at all it doesn't participate in any catalytic reactions here we are we subjected our non cubic strained gold to a simple catalytic action that is para nitrophenol going to aminophenol okay this few crystals prepared on substrate we dipped it this is a standard experiment solved in nano people carry out uh, i'm not a great uh, expert in catalysis and all but simple reaction and you can see readily the peak variations and all and you can plot out the uh, rate constants from the reaction what we monitor spectroscopically this is the bar written there where no catalyst is there and with respect to mole fraction of non non fcc zero which means this is the fcc peak right we hardly see anything i mean prepared in the same way probably there is tiny amount of non fcc stuck but otherwise when we increase the mole fraction of non fcc you see the increment in the catalytic activity this is what the new scientist journal called this is a weird finding that something is nobler than gold but it exhibit catalysis so in our angevanda chemistry paper we titled that as uh, nobler than noble gold so because of all these properties with this uh, let me conclude um, uh, again it has been a great honor inviting me and you know such a pleasure to share our experiments with you and uh, i told you the story of gold under unusual chemical conditions wet chem chemical conditions very very down to earth hot plate glass substrate ordinary temperatures and working with simple organic precursors we have realized only playing around the kinetics of the process we could actually crystallize gold into very unconventional lattices and this gold is not the typical gold and it exhibits very, very different property with this i would like to thank uh, my collaborators there are many of them actually i just want to point out that uh, uh, ganga who with whom this work got started he worked with the professor sampath for summer and to sampath uh, recommended that uh, he's a good guy sincerely i wanted to take he couldn't take because his group was full so i took him and he did wonderful actually and then went out to do postdoc second postdoc at manchester he was with gain and uh, he came home for something met with an accident and passed away you know very very unfortunate event in my group so i i know what the loss means you know today also i am standing here in memory of someone okay thank you if you have questions you may thank you professor kulkarni for a very inspiring and exciting talk you made such a technical topic so so simple and easy for non technical people to understand so thank you very much for that because we have the permission to take a few questions i'll request the audience if they have any questions so if there are any questions from the audience prakash can and uh, i have couple of queries uh, regarding that your uh, gold uh, which you have shown that uh, different facets right and where you said that you can have that uh, molecular layers deposition on that like you have that gold in different direction like say for 100 or 111 so now if you have that your like say for thiols which is uh, much more favorable right uh, due to that soft soft interactions so now if you try to measure the electrical properties depending on that different uh, facets of that gold do you think that it will differ their electrical conductivity or electronic properties broadly into say you want to know before absorbing the molecules or with the molecules absorbed yeah, both ways both ways yes uh, with the molecules absorbed we have not measured but without molecules uh, no we don't find any difference in the in the kind of you know experimental setup whatever we have uh, we have measured for, for example two terminal device put one rice particle across and establish contact we don't find any difference whether it is fcc or non fcc yeah because there are several reports on silicon actually but uh, mostly they do on that single molecular electronic so there there are a lot of difference i think there was one paper even in nature chemistry sure and so i must tell you here that a good metal like gold not only it is difficult to make it forget its uh, crystalline lattice because if you look at the energy level diagram it goes so deep you know with respect to fcc and so is the case with respect to the free electrons which are there they are extremely you know the carrier density everything is written in gold itself it's, it's and now you change the lattice a little bit 
only the chemical properties will mostly get affected because of the adsorption geometry and what not. But as far as the free electrons movements are concerned, no, not, no, not much. This, in fact, I myself had to get convinced by a theoretician. But there, uh, this electronic coupling may differ, right? Like if you have the different facet, like super gold and thiol, that coupling strength, That's so right. that can vary and that will affect that your overall conductivity. That's right. In fact, Shobhana looked at the descent movement with respect to Fermi's. I, I showed a plot there, you know, where a slight movement is there. This is the one. How the descenter moves in different on different facets. This is a theoretical finding. So three minus three point four eight to minus three point three six with respect to come closer to the Fermi surface. So slight movements are there, but to catch them probably you need to go down to millikelvin or something at in ambient temperature or kind of liquid energy temperatures we couldn't see anything. Okay, my last question. So there you have shown that uh, this. Uh, orientation variation at a different uh, temperature uh, like you went up to 700 degrees somewhere so are they reversible if you now cool down will that it come back to that previous orientation no if you if you heat it to 300 400 degrees centigrade cool down you get back whatever you had no change at all but if you go beyond 500 it becomes non reversible okay. thank you thank you interesting work you know, G, I showed our gold doesn't form amalgam and doesn't dissolve in a query. <laughs> uh, thank you, Prakash. Uh, you want to ask? Yeah, uh, uh, th this is about your bipyramid. Uh, there is a quite corrugation on the surface, although they should have a very clear faces in a crystalline structures. Uh, theory also don't comment on that looks like neither theory or experiments, why such system should have a corrugated surfaces, rather they should have a clean cut facets. Yeah, this we have talked in the paper uh, where we did theory with Umesh Vagmare mm -hmm. in the Jack's paper, how the decahedras pile up and what are decahedras one 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 facets under the twist and because they you know get into each other, they end up forming these uh, high index facets. Okay. Crazy. All the cubic lattices will have only one, 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 zero, zero. Yes, yes, typical yes. low end. But here we come across very high numbers. If you index them, very high numbers. I mean, can't that be seen in, in the form of twinning, multi-twinning? Multi-twinning, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, so, I was thinking about that. Yeah, yeah, no, I couldn't get into the details. Okay. With synchrotron study, when mm -hmm. I say six degree twist is there, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we have actually established how much is the twinning spread out across the length. Yes, thank you. Uh, my last one is the bipyramid is very interesting, uh, but that is having two phases together, at least two phases together. In the absence of the caps, for example, FCC, the body centered orthogonal or uh, tetragonal, do exist as crystals? They as do. a single phase? They do. The ones uh, we etched out, the, we chopped off the heads, you know. I showed yeah. you one. Uh, the etching yeah. uh, these process, ones, yeah. These ones, if you keep monitoring them, uh -huh. they continue to exhibit enriched non FCC. So you essentially washed away the FCC part. That is true. Yeah. They, they are not quenching back to FCC? No. no. Surprise, actually. They don't. Sometimes. Okay. They, don't, they don't at all. Okay. They retain the non FCC. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, a lot of questions being asked. Uh, I was just wondering that, uh, have you noticed that when you see the phase transition, what about the gold gold distance or interactions changing? Because there must be a uh, huge difference in that. What because you have structures. What distance you mentioned? Gold gold. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is what we measure in terms of the A, C, C by A ratios. When we have the entire crystallography data with us. Yeah, we, yeah. We build That's why I am asking Absolutely. that what is the distance, how the distance is changing on that. Well, this is something I couldn't really get into details. I had the super here, for example. This is one example. So when we are treating with argon plus beam, you can see the A parameter and C parameter, right? So this is the BCT tetragonal phase. You see the triangles there. Nothing much happens. They remain the same against the argon exposure. But beyond a certain limit, it no longer exists. The whole thing transforms now 
to you see the BCT1 structure. This is a variation. It is born somewhere here and it continues to exist. This is actually its A parameter. It holds the A intact, which is lesser than lesser to some extent compared to A of the previous BCT, but its C goes on expanding. Every minute detail is available. Just that we have to churn the data into some interpretation. Um, so, uh, uh, you showed the gold has the FCC on the outside, so is it possible that we etch away the FCC and use the non-FCC as a seed for growing further this metastable phase, just like we grow diamond artificially, is it possible to Absolutely do that? Absolutely possible, great idea, maybe we will collaborate, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, we need some students to work on, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you mean these seeds, right? Where you have chopped off everything yes, and just yes. retain the internal yeah. stuff. Yes, definitely. definitely. Any more questions from anybody? So, once again, thank you, Professor Kulkarni, for the nice talk and also for ans uh, patiently answering all the queries that we had. So, now I request uh, Professor VK Singh to give a gift to Professor Kulkarni uh, on behalf of the department. We would like to give you one more gift or memento from the department again for uh, accepting our invitation and giving this lecture today. Professor Vera. I request Professor Vera to give a memento to Mrs. Nikam. Thank you, Professor Bera. Now, I request Professor Bera to give the concluding remarks. Well, this is just thank you people. At first, Professor Kulkarni for coming and giving this excellent talk. Uh, to my colleagues, uh, to the students who are here and listen, listening to the talk, I would also like to thank our office staff, uh, and mainly Supriya and Gauravji for making all the arrangement and also the do support from the DORA office. And also thank you, Ramesh, for organizing everything. Thank you.